Greetings, diners, and welcome to the Collapse Cafe of the Doomstead Diner. And you note that I did not say the Coro News Report for this one. So I'm giving us a break from the depressing news of coronavirus uh, this week. And uh, instead, I'm <clears throat> going to talk on a more upbeat level with... Uh, a long-time contributor to the diner, uh, Irv Mills, who uh, runs his own blog as well, The Easiest Person to Fool. Uh, and uh, he writes uh, some very good, extensive articles, very well researched, uh, and uh, has uh, a lot of interests, I think, that the diners and expertise that the diners will be interested in uh, learning about. And he's also extremely well read. <laughs> uh, he publishes a list of things he's reading uh, once a month or so, and uh, it's uh, long. <laughs> uh, but uh, very good stuff uh, in there. Uh, so if you're looking for a bibliography, a uh, place to find out uh, material to read, uh, Irv's blog is a good place to do that. Uh, all right, so uh, without further ado, let's meet Irv. Irv, say hi to the crowd. Hello. All right. Uh, and uh, it, Irv is in uh, Ontario, so I guess this, uh, his uh, little abode there is, is somewhere in Ontario. Uh, oh, Irv, why don't you uh, bring the diners up to speed on you know, where you come from and uh, stuff you've done in your life and, you know, how, how you got into collapse and so forth. All right. I, I, right now I'm living in a little town on the uh, eastern shore of Lake Huron called Kincardine. Uh, that's a place named from Scotland and the town is saturated with, uh, with Scottish stuff. But um, I grew up on a farm about 100 miles east of here, inland. And uh, it was a, I guess, a fairly typical family farm of that time in the 50s and 60s and so forth. Uh, my dad owned it. Uh, he had uh, several brothers nearby who owned farms and they shared machinery and labor. And, uh, and you know, we grew, uh, I guess cattle was the, was the main thing. We weren't into cash crops, cattle and sometimes pigs. And uh, as I got old enough, I got put to work, uh, you know, doing various things around the farm, driving the tractor, bringing in hay and, and that kind of thing. And uh, fixing fence and just generally fixing things up around the uh, the uh, farm and so I got used to using tools and uh, I, uh, I got handy with them I guess to some extent. Um, I went to uh, to school at a little it was a, a three-room school uh, that was only about half a mile away and actually walked to it for the first few years oh, before they brought in <laughs> before they brought in uh, busing and then uh, when I graduated from public school, I went to uh, high school at a town about 15 miles away, a long bus ride. Uh, I went all the way to grade 13, which was something Ontario had at the time for people who were planning to go to university. And then I, I went to university, actually the University of Toronto, for uh, the grand total of three weeks. And yeah. then uh, dro dropped out, came home, uh, worked for one of the neighbors harvesting potatoes and uh, and then uh, landed a job with the provincial power generating trans transmission and uh, distribution utility, which was known as Ontario Hydro because a lot of the generation was uh, hydroelectric. And I worked uh, for them as a uh, an electrician, uh, not what you probably think of as an electrician, this was uh, looking after equipment in the uh, in the switch yards uh, here and there around the province, yeah, and, uh, and breakers and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, big tra power transformers, circuit breakers, uh, 
switches, that kind of thing. Also, uh, batteries and battery chargers because there has to be something. When, when the power goes out, uh, the power stations still need power, so they have backup built in. Uh, and uh, I worked there for 31 years, moved up from electrician to foreman of the crew of electrician I've been working in. And, and for the last year, I was uh, promoted to manager of the, the uh, establishment here. Uh, the reason I ended up in King Carden was I came to work with uh, Hyderun's, or well, eventually, the, everything got reorganized and uh, they split the, the single company up into several smaller companies and uh, the part I was in was called and still is called Hydro One. And uh, I came to work in the switchyards at the, uh, at the Bruce Nuclear Power Development, which is, uh, I believe it's still the largest uh, nuclear power development in the world. And it's about uh, 10 miles north of here along the lake. Which, is, it, uh, is it generating power? It is. It is. Yeah. When, when, yeah, did, it, when was it completed? When was it completed? Uh, in the hmm, in the late 1980s. Oh, okay. There are actually eight nuclear units there. Uh -huh. in, uh, and uh, it can turn out something over uh, 6,000 megawatts, 6 gigawatts, when they're all running. Uh, and, it just, it, and it supplies a good, a good chunk of Ontario's electricity. Uh, so that was that was if, interesting. What about the hydropower? Uh, is there a hydro plant near you? Um, no. Uh, the hydro plants, uh, there's one, several actually at, Ni at Niagara Falls. Uh, there's some on the Ottawa River. Uh, there's... Uh, quite a few on rivers in northern Ontario, and there are a few small ones uh, scattered around the countryside where there happens to be some water that's flowing downhill. Uh, the nearest one to me would be oh, maybe 70, 80 miles east of here uh, called Eugenia Generating Station, and uh, its claim to fame, it's, pro it's probably got the most head. The the water falls the farthest, I think, of any generating station in Ontario. It's around 600 feet. More than uh, Niagara? But unfor Pardon me? More than Niagara? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. A couple, two or three times more. But the amount of water that's available is hardly more than a trickle. Ah. Uh, a, a single uh, four-foot pipe, what they call a penstock, can take the, the whole thing. And the thing is, there's there's a lake at the top end uh, and there's cottagers around the lake and they get a little miffed if if uh, you use too much water and, and leave them with a mud flat rather than a lake. So it uh, when I was there, I did work there a little bit, uh, it might at its peak turn out two or three megawatts of power. That has to be enough for, you know, a small small community oh yeah yeah and it, and it did of course it in and when you say our power comes from such and such a place it all goes into the grid and sort of gets mixed up and mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to say where it's actually coming from if someone now, says oh i don't i don't like nuclear power don't send me any nuclear power uh that's really not possible <laughs> once, once it's in the grid it, it yeah. yeah so it's all it's all uh, it's like a uh, what they call a jailhouse stew. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you bet. It's All just mixed every, together. You know, whatever is available. But uh, but could you, like that, that little plant <clears throat> that you mentioned, could you uh, rewire it, if you were, and take it off the grid and then, uh, you know, set up transformers and so forth locally so that it could, could by itself just serve, you know, a thousand uh, houses? It would, it would be even simpler than that. Uh, if you wanted to disconnect that section of the province from the rest of the grid, you would just go around and open up some switches, and and there would be a local area there that uh, that Eugenia could power. A uh, little bit of a trick maintaining the frequency. Uh, I think, yeah, they 
So you might be getting 59 hertz or 61 hertz instead of the standard 60, but yeah, it, it easily could do that. Well, that and I know, of, I, I know of at least one after collapse book written by a friend of mine in the next town down the lake here who uh, he actually had them doing that. Uh, uh, yeah, and I sure. think that, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, general move towards localization and things like that, that we're probably going to see uh, over, you know, over the long term or medium term, I should say, uh, that uh, that that kind of thing will probably happen. Uh, you know, of course, you can't be sure, but uh, but, you know, it seems seems likely. Uh, and what about the nuke plant? Uh, are you concerned at all about, uh, you know, that thing staying up and running as uh, the uh, other energy supplies uh, become scarce? You know, I mean, they, they take a lot of maintenance and they they generally take, uh, you know, they have their spent fuel ponds and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, how's that being handled? I think fairly well. Um, first of all, uh, in Canada here, we developed our own type of reactor, which uses uh, unenriched uranium and uh, a heavy water moderator to, to make that work. And uh, so by its very nature, it's a, a quite a bit safer than the, uh, the ones in the States, which are used enriched uranium and light water. Uh, and there's, because they were, uh, I don't know, probably what? The very first Canadian reactors were built in the 60s. So I guess a decade or so behind the American ones. And so they, uh, they're they a little more modern in their safety features. Uh, one of the big problems uh, with a nuclear reactor is it it's generating a lot of power and it's kind of hard to say, whoa, um, because there's there's heat in the reactor. When you shut it down, you've got to have somewhere. Normally, all that heat's getting turned into electricity. Right. And if suddenly you're disconnected from the grid, the uh, the concern is, um, where what do we do with the heat? And uh, and what do you do? These, with? Well, these these reactors, uh, if if everything goes just right. Uh, and this has happened occasionally. You were, you've probably heard of the uh, the great um, outage of, I think it was 2003. Yeah, it had to be. Uh, on the eastern seaboard of North America. Uh, yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, Actually, I was in. I remember best. It's the 1967 blackout uh, that hit New York City. Uh, I had just yeah. returned from Brazil. I was like 10 years old. And, uh, you know, that one, uh, that one sticks in my mind as, you know, my big blackout. We had many blackouts when I lived in Brazil. Uh, they were yeah. like a weekly feature of life in the yeah. 1960s in Brazil. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I learned at that time to carry a flashlight all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll say. I'll <laughs> say. I, I have yeah, that. Me too. I have that habit to this day. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, this I got one on my keychain here. High and, uh, it's very nice. I, I highly recommend this one. It's rechargeable. See? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, You're blinding us all. Yeah, uh, blinding everybody. Uh, very good. Light-emitting light diodes have made flashlights a lot better. But anyways, oh. to get back, yeah, I remember the the uh, big outage, the blackout. I, I thought it was 65, but it doesn't matter exactly. Uh, I was on the farm then, and we brought out the coal oil lamp, and... Uh, put some wood in the cook stove and, and we were fine. Uh, in 2003, there was in the summertime, strangely enough, in August, but it was a matter nowadays, the, uh, the, the peak is often in the summer when everyone's air conditioning is on. And somewhere down in Ohio, there was a utility who couldn't cope and uh, it was, they tripped off and there was this cascading effect and pretty soon all of Ontario and and New York and uh, other states adjacent were in the dark. Uh, but no problem for the nuclear plants here. First, there's systems that shut them down safely. And, uh, and one of the units 
at, at Bruce B, there's two stations, each with four units, Bruce A and B. Uh, one of them, Unit 6, actually managed to keep on running. They have a mode they can go into where they just pump the heat into the lake and uh, and heat up the lake water. And they were running along. Oh. And, uh, and so they were the first generation really to get hooked back up to the system. Uh -huh. And I remember uh, I'd just gone home from work that night and the lights went out and my boss calls and says, so you better get back in here. This is, this is big. And uh, the guys in my crew were all sent out to the various transformer stations around this area. And uh, for some reason, in addition to the, the grid going down, the communication system, which allowed the remote operators to to turn things on and off had gone too. And we ended up having to go out with our cell phones and and uh, use the controls in each of these stations to turn the local towns back on. I uh, I actually ended up turning King Carden back on, which was kind of fun. You don't, don't normally get to do that kind of thing. But anyways, yes, there's systems for shutting the, the uh, plants down, systems where they can run if they're really, if they're the bad thing for a nuclear station is to be disconnected from the grid, but there are systems built in where they can do that. Uh, and they have huge uh, tanks of jet fuel and standby generators that are basically a jet engine hooked up to a, a, a smallish generator, about 15 megawatts, mm -hmm. uh, enough to last for long enough to get the, the fuel, the, the reactors cooled down so it doesn't need the big pumps, the cooling how, pumps anymore. How long does that cooling process take? Um, a few weeks altogether hmm. till it's, till you could walk, you know, well, you wouldn't walk away from it. But and I, I get talking to this, uh, to people about this fairly often. And of course, there's a lot of fear uh, related to nuclear power and concern about what, what indeed happens if the grid finally goes down forever. And uh, there seems to be a feeling that the uh, the people working at nuclear plants will just uh, get, get, get up, go to their parking lot and drive their cars away and leave the thing to fail however it might. But I know a lot of guys, I mean, I worked in the switchyard. I didn't work inside the plant, but I know a lot of fellows uh, who do work in the plant and uh, that would be the last thing that would happen. They would hang around for sure and uh, make sure it got shut down safely. Uh -huh. And the last thing, eventually you end up with a bunch of spent fuel uh, sitting in a thing that looks like a swimming pool. And for a long while that has to be cooled, but eventually it cools off enough so it can just sit there. And what do you do with that? I mean- How long does that cooling process take? A few years? Uh, yeah, a few years. And then eventually it gets to the point, and this happened before they built the, the big stations here. There was a, a small nuclear station uh, with a big white dome where inside which the reactor was. Um, you may even have seen pictures of it. It was Douglas Point Generating Station, it was called. It was only about 220 megs of output, but it was the first uh, commercially viable reactor they built in Ontario. There were experimental ones before that. Anyways, in the late 80s, uh, it had ended its life uh, and they shut it down, moved all the fuel into the spent fuel bay, let it cool down, and then, well, what are we going to do with that? Uh, so they built these things that look sort of like small silos, what some people call dry flasks, concrete wow. containers that are maybe, I don't know, these ones were pretty small, six feet in diameter, I would guess, and 20 feet high with a, a, a smallish hole down the middle. And the fuel went in there. And uh, they're sitting on a, a good solid cement pad next to the that station. Uh, there's maybe a dozen of them or so. And there they sit. And uh, they'll be safe for a long time there. So I don't panic too much about living 10 miles from a nuclear station, even if we have some sort of a collapse and and it has to be shut down and and rendered safely i i'm pretty sure that the the people who work there would uh, 
would want to do that. I mean, their families are all living a few miles away. So there you have it. And it looks like Skype may have failed us here. Can you hear me, Ari? Greetings, folks. We're back. Okay. Somewhere between the last great frontier of Alaska and the great white north of Ontario, some router, somewhere. Yeah. And our call was dropped. Okay. Very sad. <laughs> but uh, a few minutes went by and uh, the connection, we were able to restore the connection. So we're back. And uh, we were discussing nuclear power and uh, some of the uh, problems and solutions that exist with that. And so uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Irv, uh, who will pick it up as best he can. Okay. Irv? Yeah. Thanks, Ari. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where we lost it, but I think I was uh, talking about the, the issue of what happens to a nuclear plant when uh, it loses its connection to the grid. And uh, that is one of the, the most serious problems for a nuclear plant. But fortunately, they're set up with uh, standby generators and uh, large tanks of jet fuel to run the uh, generators. And uh, the other thing that I, I hear in discussions of this is there seems to be a feeling, at least in the United States, that the, uh, the crews running these plants will just disappear. Well, I know a lot of guys who are uh, involved in that, my neighbors here in Kincardin, uh, and they have a pretty good incentive since their families are only about 10 miles from this nuclear plant to uh, actually hang in there and get it shut down into a safe uh, um, state. And uh, I have pretty good confidence they will, or I wouldn't be spending my retirement here. And uh, interestingly, I was chatting one day when I was out walking my dog recently uh, with a young fellow who does, uh, who is an operator at the nuclear plant. Uh, I won't give his name and I won't officially quote him, but he was mentioning that they have contingency plans uh, in place. Uh, at the moment, there in Kincardine, there are only four confirmed cases of COVID-19. And in the whole of the two local counties, uh, the, the health unit has identified, I think, maybe about 60 cases. So it's not too serious at the moment, but the, the, uh, the people running the, the nuclear plant have been thinking about this. And if it comes down to it, uh, they'll ask for volunteers and uh, have enough people to run the place, uh, go in and uh, be isolated there so that they don't get sick and uh, and and they never want they won't get into a situation where they don't have enough people to run the uh, the plant safely is the idea. It's reassuring that they've been thinking ahead like that. that Anyways, I, I don't really want to sound like a. Uh, a great booster for the nuclear industry, but uh, it's not as, I don't think it is as bad a situation as uh, many people have been led to believe. Anyways. Well, one thing is the, uh, you know, that, that new plant, I think you mentioned that it probably was built in the 80s. So it's probably, you know, still 10 years away from its design lifespan, uh, the end of, you know, when it needs to be decommissioned. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem with the, uh, a lot of the uh, reactors here in the FS of A is they were built, as you mentioned, in the 50s and 60s. And, uh, you know, there are quite a few of them that are actually well past the point yeah. of their, uh, their design life. And, you know, that's that's the issue now. And then it's uh, the cost uh, of decommissioning one of these plants. You know, who pays for that? And uh, yeah. it, it ends up being the taxpayer, of course. Uh and that's one of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, privatized the profits, socialized the losses. Uh, Indeed. Capitalism. Uh, yep. Those, those costs are externalized uh, <laughs> over, the, over the years. Uh, that, that's been done here as well. Back around the turn of the century, uh, they were looking at, um, it was time to uh, not shut down, but refurbish uh, units one and two. Mm -hmm. uh, here at the Bruce, and uh, the uh, it was going to cost a lot of money, 
and uh, even the provincial government wasn't uh, too keen to take on the job. So a private, I guess you'd call it consortium of a number of people with money uh, got together, called themselves Bruce Power, and uh, the province offered them a what I would call a bit of a sweetheart deal, where they get to run the uh, the plant uh, from somewhere around the year 2000 until, well, it's going to be probably in the 2040s before they're done. Uh, they get they get the profits, and they promise to put uh, part of that profit into refurbishing all eight of the units. And uh, indeed, they did uh, a minor refurbishment on units one and two, and starting sometime around now, as soon as the pandemic is under control, uh, the plans are to spend the next, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years or more uh, refurbishing all eight of those units. And then they'll run them as long as they can, and then they'll, and then uh, when they're done, they hand it back to the province and the province, the provincial government gets stuck with uh, safely mothballing these plants. Yeah. So as you say, the, the private company gets the, the profit and uh, the public gets to pick up the, the mess at the end, the yeah. cleanup at the end, which is, uh, you know, the thing, the thing that scares me, the one thing that scares me about nuclear power isn't the radiation or anything like that. That's nicely under control. It's um, when these plants reach the end of their lifetime, uh, they need to be safely shut down. The fuel needs to be safely taken care of and uh, I believe the technology exists to do that. Uh, what's lacking is the political will. Uh, well, it's also extremely expensive. I think yes. you know, France, France has the most developed nuclear system. You know, they generate a lot of their power with nuke. They and, do. Uh, and they also have uh, the most advanced sequestering of, of spent fuel. Uh, mm -hmm. They have tunnel that was be, that they built you know several miles under and uh, uh, whatnot to store the fuel in uh, but the expense that expense of uh, creating that business has been you know enormous to begin with and uh, you know it's still not complete and it's uh, still got a NIMBY problem you know uh, oh yes people, uh, people don't want to live above you know a huge store of radioactive material, it's going to take, you know, 10,000 years before it's uh, not, you know, uh, putting out radiation. And, uh, you know, the best designed concrete bunker in the world is going to start to develop cracks and it's going to get leaks over mm -hmm. a thousand years. Okay? It's just going to happen. And, uh, you know these these whole this whole those whole things have to stay watertight because if they're not watertight, water seeps in, fills up the chamber, and then all of that radioactive material is just about all of it is soluble. All right, it's going to get into the water, uh, and then once it gets into the water, then it gets into the water supply, and once it gets into the water supply, people drink it. And that's the problem. It's when it's well, not. I, it's not I, I'm not going to argue. I, I'm not going to argue on that. But before we get to that point, uh, as you're well aware, uh, the our economy is contracting, uh -huh. and we're building up huge amounts of debts, and uh, the money to undertake a project like this. That that I think is uh, is is the issue. Uh, well, and the, and the NIMBY problem, the not in my backyard. We're encountering that around here already. There was the uh, there was a plan proposed to uh, store all the low and mid level wastes. You know the brooms and rags and paper coveralls that get contaminated in the course of running a nuclear plant to uh, store them uh, deep underground 
and it sounded like a pretty good plan to me, but uh, it's not going to happen. When, uh-huh. I, when I said political will, I meant that the, the public doesn't want it to happen. And right. it's not going to. And uh, there's longer term plans to uh, store the, uh, the spent fuel underground, something like France has done. And my prediction is that that won't happen. Uh, for the same reason, the NIMBY thing and the, uh, the mm-hmm. lack of, we'll get to the, I think, just about the same time as, as the local station uh, is ready to, uh, to be finally shut down. We may be to the point where we couldn't afford to do it even if we wanted to, you know, that, and that's that, an issue. It looks like it gets closer every day. Okay. Yeah. You know, you talk about some things getting exponentially bigger. Other things are getting exponentially shorter in time, like how, yeah. much, how much future we have of business as usual, BAU. As yeah, usual. well, I, I try not to make predictions because as some famous guy once said, the predictions are hard to do, especially about the future. Um, and, you know, it. who knows? Is it going to be five years or 20? But it's it's not going to be 500 years. No, that I'm sure of, or right. even 100. So, you know, so that's a bit of a concern. Uh, anyways, uh, where would we like to go next? Because I think I'm I'm kind of run down on the, the issue yeah, of. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think that was a fairly uh, comprehensive treatise on uh, nuclear energy and so forth. Uh, my phone uh, is ringing, but my oh, beloved wife is, will get it, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and she has. So there yeah, we go. There you, go. Uh, uh, you, were, you were about to suggest the next tangent I should go off uh, on. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to comply. So, yeah, I was just saying that, uh, uh, you know, it was a pretty extensive discussion of, of power generation and nuclear in particular. Uh, so uh, where I'd like to go from here is another interest of yours. You talked about farming. Can, can I'm sorry, Ari. Uh, I got to well, take that it, phone call. Well, well, just we'll hang on a minute and, and we'll come back. We'll put it on. It'll hold. only be a short time. Okay.